and uh, okay. All right, thank you, Dimitra. Um, hello and good morning, everyone. It's my great pleasure to introduce Winko and today. Uh, he's a fourth year PhD student at Carnegie Mellon, and he's a returning intern with our team, the Audio and Acoustics Research Group, working on brain computer interfaces. And with that, Winko, please take it away. Thank you, Hannes, for the introduction. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. So before I start, uh, please feel free to interrupt me anytime if you have a question uh, during the talk. So today, uh, I'm very excited to share with uh, all of you what I did in the past uh, three months. Uh, so I will start with some backgrounds. Like uh, uh, in, in the title, there is a term called EEG headphone. So what is EEG actually? Uh, EEG stands for electroencephalography. So it is a recording of electrical potential along the scalp. So a common way of, of grabbing that, that information is by placing multiple electrodes. They are usually integrated into a head. And we can put on this head and we can measure uh, the potential change along the scalp over time. So these electrodes are picking up some neural activities. Uh, when a neuron fires, uh, it generates a certain waveform called action potential. Uh, however, just bear in mind that uh, EEG is not picking up a single neuron firing. Uh, it's impossible to, to capture that with the electrodes outside your brain. Uh, instead, it's picking up synchrony of a, uh, of a local population of neurons. So suppose there is a uh, synchronous behavior uh, within a local population, then that's what EEG is picking up from the brain. So decades of EEG study shows that uh, EEG carries information about a person's uh, perception and emotion, and it can also be modulated by a person's cognitive states, like attention. So it offers a space for neural engineers to build an interface to communicate with an external device directly using our brain. And that's the whole uh, basic, uh, basic idea behind uh, brain-computer interface, or BCI. So by definition, BCI is a communication or control system that allows real-time interaction between the human brain and the external devices. It has been used in many applications, like you can see in the picture uh, on existing technology, when the, the, the patient or uh, the user can put on an EEG cap, and then uh, just by using his mind, he can control this wheelchair to navigate. Or in some, uh, BCI has also been applied in some stress monitoring applications. Uh, for example, the interface can real timely uh, monitor a person's uh, stress level and interactively uh, give some co some components accordingly. So um, a very simple way to implement this uh, this uh, BCI system is to label is try to decode different cognitive states first and then label these states with a specific system output. For example, if we can decode the person's attention to left, then we can label that with a left click. And uh, uh, similarly, we can label the attention to the right as a right click. And then uh, if we can combine these functions uh, with eye tracking, for example, then we may uh, control a mouse without even moving our fingers or hand. So this type of uh, binary output, like being left or right, uh, even though they sound very simple, but uh, they may actually have great values in certain applications. And uh, therefore, this kind of binary output is what we focus on for this project. And uh, so a very uh, popular way of uh, designing a BCI paradigm is by using external stimuli. And the whole idea is uh, you can present multiple objects uh, for a chosen sensor modality and ask the person to pay attention to one of these objects. Uh, in vision, so as you can see in the picture, people can present, for example, four or even more circles in the screen. And these circles may flash at different rates. And when you are paying attention to one of them, the rate at which the attended target flashes will show up as a stronger component in the EEG signal. And we call this type of response a steady state visual evoked uh, potential, or as SSVEP. Similarly, in audition, um, people also uh, play sound through to uh, different ear uh, or audio channels. 
And uh, these uh, sounds are usually pure tones, and they are modulated by a different uh, modulation frequency. So when you are paying attention to one of them, the, mod the attended modulated modulation frequency may have a stronger component. So even though these uh, neural signatures uh, are well studied, and uh, for, for example, SSVP have been reported to be very robust across sessions and across subjects, uh, one downside of using these paradigms is that uh, these stimuli can actually cause fatigue very easily. Just, just imagine that if you stare at a flashing object, constantly flashing, or listening to uh, a modulated uh, pure, pure tone for more than like 10 minutes, for example, it, it won't be a very pleasant experience. So with that in mind, uh, we try to evaluate uh, the user friendliness of the current uh, EEG based uh, uh, BCS system and see if we can find some room to improve. And it turns out there's a lot of room for us to work on. Uh, here I'm showing you uh, a very typical EEG based study or EEG study. Uh, people it usually, uh, so the EEG cap usually has multiple channels and that number of channels can can go from maybe 24 all the way up to 128 or even more. So if you choose, and also if you choose a wired EEG system, it, it means there's always a big bundle of cables behind you when you're using it. And these cables are uh, connected to a, an amplifier, as you can see here, uh, which uh, is usually very bulky and, uh, and heavy in the same time. So, um, Therefore, it means um, sometimes it's very over. It can be very overwhelming for the user to to carry it around if they want to use this BCI system outside. And it also sounds uh, it it also looks very obtrusive when you are putting it on. Also, many of these uh, EEG systems uh, they use gel-based electrodes. So we put gel between the electrode and the scalp to make sure there's a good. Uh, 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 connectivity between these two. So it means every time you, before you use it, uh, you have to put gel in those, uh, each of these holes, and it may take some time to, 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 to make it work. And this gel can also be very sticky and messy. So after you use it, you also need to wash it off. So that creates some extra overhead in, in time and effort uh, before and after each time you use the uh, reset system. And also, as I said before, uh, some stimuli like the constantly flashing objects uh, can cause fatigue easily. Uh, and some paradigms, like uh, if you use motor imagery, it may require a very uh, lengthy training session before a subject can be able to, to use them at all. So this list can go on and on. And so all the factors together, adding, together makes BCI a less uh, mature technology, I would say, for the consumer market. And uh, this motivates us to think about if we can uh, to, to explore the feasibility of building a user-friendly and also functional auditory uh, BCI system. So this is a very uh, general question or an open-ended open question. So we narrow it down to three specific aims. The first one is uh, we want to use a more compact form factor to collect EG data. Uh, we want to walk away from uh, the messy, like uh, uh, EEG, like gel-based EEG system, of course. And we want to use more pleasant stimuli we do, because we don't want to annoy our subjects. And these two points usually mean that uh, we need to compromise on certain aspects. For example, uh, we might end up using uh, fewer channels uh, than a traditional EEG system, or the SNR may not be good because we, we walk away from gel-based uh, sensors. So the third aim is to see if we can maintain a very high decoding accuracy and efficiency of the system when we achieve the first two points. So regarding these uh, form factor, uh, as I said, we definitely want to walk away from this kind of site setup. So a smart idea would be uh, embed this EEG system into some existing products uh, that people wear daily. For example, there's a, there's a smart design that combines uh, EEG system or EEG electrodes into a hat, so people just uh, can put it on and walk away with it. 
or if we target some uh, VR or AR users, we can try to combine this EEG system with a VR or AR headset. Since people need to put them on anyway, it offers a very convenient space for us to collect EEG data as well. Another even very uh, even smarter, but also very challenging idea is to collect EEG data from uh, earphones or, or ear canals. So this is a work that uh, was done at, at MSR last year by another intern. So he built this, uh, these earphones uh, with electrodes at the ear tips. So he collected signals from this device and tried to use them to decode the person's uh, stress level. And the results were pretty good. So this year, um, since we want to focus on the auditory domain, so we decided, we decided to use this new product in the market uh, called smartphone with an F. Uh, so the idea is to combine this uh, EEG system into a, a set of headphones. So they have three sensors on the top and four sensors on each side. Uh, they're using saline solution based uh, sensors, meaning you have to soak some uh, sponges overnight and then put them into those sockets every time you use it. Uh, it's not perfect, but uh, compared to gel based system, uh, it's uh, still very uh, handy and it, it requires very less time to, to prepare this system. Uh, and also compared to dry sensors, uh, this offers more uh, co connectivity between the sensor and the scalp. So it's kind of a trade off. So, um, and also, this is a perfect match for our project because we need to play sound anyway. And by integrating a headphone into, a, or say, EEG into a headphone, it makes perfect sense. So, um, last year when I was intern at MSR, we tried to use auditory, uh, we also tried to build an auditory. BCI system, and I used a sequence of tones, and uh, I tried to make it more pleasant uh, by creating somewhat like a melody uh, for the users. Uh, so this year we want to just uh, go one step further in that direction. So we want to use real music because people can enjoy listening to music for a very long time without being annoyed. So if we can find the right uh, kind of music, then, then we can probably decode their attention. So we tried to do some literature review in the first few weeks of my internship. Uh, there wasn't very, there, there aren't very uh, much um, uh, studies on this domain, uh, but there was one study, uh, they were using polyphonic music, meaning they have multiple instruments uh, in, their, in their stimuli, and they can ask people to pay attention to a specific instrument when they are playing the sound mixture. And they found some uh, interesting new signatures when the person uh, is paying attention to a specific uh, stream. So we think maybe we can um, borrow this idea to use polyphonic music as the stimuli and ask people to pay attention. Um, yeah, so in the next session, I will uh, share with you what we designed for our experiment. So we created uh, stimuli using song uh, excerpts. So the one for, so we use, uh, which was three instruments, uh, vibraphone, piano, and harmonica. Uh, the one for vibraphone is, uh, is from I'm Yours, the song I'm Yours. The one for piano is from uh, wherever you go, you will go. And the one for harmonica is from uh, Forever Young. Uh, I want to play the, the piano one just uh, to give you a taste, but I'm not sure whether the audio is, is working. Uh, so let me try. Do you hear anything? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, we can hear. So, cool. So uh, that's for the piano. And if we combine all three together, it creates uh, a mixture. So the reason why we chose these three songs uh, is because they're using the same chord sequence. And if we, if we combine, combine them together because they are using, following the same chord progression, uh, the, the mixture creates a very uh, harmonious sound. So people can really enjoy it. In the meantime, can choose to pay attention to uh, a, 
a particular instrument for the task. And uh, um, so these are the stimuli that the subject will hear more often uh, during the ex during this uh, the experiment. Uh, occasionally during the, the task, they will hear a modified version of this, and we call them uh, oddballs. So uh, there are four bars in each uh, excerpt. So to create an oddball, we uh, modify the melody by tuning the pitch uh, down, uh, up or down uh, for the second bar or the last bar. So uh, here's an example also for piano. So compared to the standard piano stimuli, we only modify one bar of it. So uh, they sound uh, exactly the same elsewhere. So the reason why the reason why we want to uh, create uh, or uh, create some oddball stimuli is because we want to create a task for the subjects to to, to focus, uh, which is a sort of incentive for them to focus more. Um, so we also recognize that it might be very challenging for people to uh, pay attention to a particular instrument if they don't have a very uh, if they don't have any like musical musical training. Uh, so we first we specialize the sound in three directions with vibraphone on the left, piano on the right, and harmonica in the middle. So with that specialization, it it becomes a very easy task for even non musicians like myself to do the task. And then, uh, so the whole experiment is trial is trial based. So in the very beginning of a, of a trial, we pre presented a visual cue being arrows pointing to different directions. Uh, this is a way to, in, to direct the person's attention to a particular direction. And then we play the excerpt twice. So the first repetition is always a standard for, this, uh, for the attended stream. And the second repetition can be either a standard or uh, a, a not standard with the out ball, either at the second or at the last uh, bar. And the task is to identify whether these two are the same or not. And they need to answer with their mouse, and then we will give a feedback to tell how they perform uh, after each uh, trial. So with this sort of uh, trial-based design, we have three conditions, and all the trials are randomized uh, for each block. Uh, we have 28 trials for attention to left and 28 trials for attention to right. We also have 14 trials for attention to middle. Uh, so attention to middle to center is not, excuse me, is not what we focus on because, as I said, we want to focus more on outputting a binary output uh, from the BCS system. But this is a very good uh, reference for us to do some sanity check. I, I will show some results from this uh, later in the in the in, in the results session. Um, we don't have a lot of trials per condition because we want to squeeze everything into 30 minutes, uh, which is good for subjects during this uh, pandemic uh, situation. And as you can imagine, this pandemic uh, makes data collection extremely challenging, especially when 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 you are working remotely like I'm doing now. So um, luckily we, we have two identical units of this smartphone, which means we can conduct the same experiment at two different places. So we came up with the plan that I recruit a few subjects in the Boston area where I live. And Dimitra helped me a lot in getting uh, a lot of subjects from the Seattle area. So together um, we have nine subjects in total, which is uh, really, a challenging, challenging task for this pandemic uh, season. But uh, this number is already very good for like a, a typical BCI system, uh, sorry, for, for typical BCI research. So um, since we have two experimental sites, so, um, and two experimenters, so I wrote an app in MATLAB to, to show the subjects all the instructions so that uh, we, we want to normalize the amount of information or how much you know about the, this, the task before they do, they actually do it. So this app has uh, like uh, the function for set up the experiment and also a training session where the subject can 
play with, around with the stimuli and the task as many times as, as they want, just to get familiar with what's going to happen in the actual uh, experiment. And then, of course, the app also has a function for the actual experiment. So every, everything is all in one uh, uh, like place, so that it makes everything easier for both the subjects and the experimenters. So now I will share with you uh, how we process our data and how we analyze it. So we collected data from EEG data from this 11 channel uh, smartphone. And uh, we did minimal pre-processing before the analysis. So this includes a band pass filter with two to eight hertz uh, pass band. And also uh, and manually remove some uh, epochs that are obviously bad. For example, this one in the in the figure. So these bad epochs are usually due to say, for example, package loss in the Bluetooth uh, connection or some strong motion artifacts, like if the subject is yawning, if the tactic is so boring, or they, they sneeze, for example. So uh, it's very easy to pick, pick them out from the, the pool. And uh, the, the reason why I chose a very narrow band for the band pass filter is because I want to apply this uh, auditory attention decoding or AAD algorithm for my data. So this method was developed based on the fact that, um, so neuroscience find, find that uh, when we are listening to a, a sound, like a running speech in this case, uh, the low frequency components like two to, two to eight hertz uh, in the EEG may resemble the envelope of the sound wave. So if we, and also if we are listening to, to two streams of sound, for example, and attend to one of them, then the attended stream may have a stronger representation uh, in the EEG signal. So if we can find a way to reconstruct the uh, stimulus envelope from the low frequency component of the EEG signal, then or we, can, um, we can use the reconstruction to correlate with the, the all the available stimuli envelopes. And that will give us, uh, so, and the one you're attending to may give you a higher correlation. And that's exactly what uh, the whole idea behind this uh, AAD method. So in, in, in this AAD uh, algorithm, we focus on two, uh, two, two signals. That's one is the stimuli feature, uh, stimuli envelope or S. Uh, the other one is the multi-channel EEG data or R. So here we are treating the, the, the brain as a, as a linear system which by the way is not true, but uh, is a very handy assumption. And then we can, using this uh, S and R signals, we can estimate um, the system response by, by using either, either of the two as the input and with the other one as the output. So for BCI, we focus more on using the, the sort, of, sort of the backward modeling or stimulus reconstruction, where we use the R as the input and the, use the stimulus envelope as the output to see if we can reconstruct it. And uh, if, suppose we can find this decoder using some method, and then we can use it to apply on a new test uh, EEG data to find the reconstruction and then correlate that envelope with the available, uh, the, with the original true envelopes we have. If you are attending to one of them, the correlation with one of them should be higher. And uh, here are some uh, equations for how this one works uh, numerically. So uh, this R, as I said, is the EEG data. And we are trying to find this decoder G, which is a function of both space, uh, which represents N, uh, sorry, which is denoted as N here. Uh, so N stands for uh, the number of channels. And there's also a function of time, which is the tau, uh, as tau here. So tau is a, a like a, a delay uh, variable uh, that, that, that is meant to, to model the delay between the stimulus onset and uh, the time it shows up in EEG. So for, uh, for, for speech decoding, usually this value is, or the, the best uh, delay value is usually 200 milliseconds. Um, so to do that, we can, give, uh, we can give a set of values for tau and then the algorithm can, can Okay, we will delay the EEG signal by a different amount and then see which one, uh, which delay value gives a good uh, reconstruction. 
So this S hat here is the reconstruction uh, and uh, the cost function to, to find the, the, the optimal G is by minimizing the mean square error between the reconstruction and the, the original uh, stimuli envelope. And uh, the solution for G in this case uh, has an autocorrelation between the responses or the EG signal plus a regularization term. Uh, we use the inverse of that and multiply with the cross correlation between the response and the stimuli envelope. So uh, I applied this AAD method on my data. Uh, I pulled uh, all the EEG uh, signals we have for the three conditions. And, uh, uh, and this forms uh, the signal R of T. And also I use the corresponding envelopes for each trial and put them together as the S of T. And then I use uh, the equation to, to, to estimate what is uh, the, our decoder. So after we get the decoder with a new trial uh, for the testing, uh, so we input these eight seconds of uh, EEG data into the recorder, uh, sorry, into the decoder, decoder, and that will give us a reconstruction. And, and then we correlate that re reconstruction with the, either the envelope of the vibraphone or the, vibra uh, the envelope of the piano. And, uh, so, and that would give us two correlations. And we can use that one as the feature we have and then train and test on a simple SVM classifier. So that's a whole uh, decoding pipeline for this uh, line of analysis. So now I will show you some results. Before we, uh, before I show you some of uh, the decoding accuracies, I want to share with you the decoder weights to see what they look like. Uh, here I'm collapsed. So as I said, this G is a function of both time and the space. So here I'm showing you uh, the average, the, 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 the G by collapsing the time axis. So I'm taking the average across all the delays we have just by showing you the weight for each uh, channel location. So here we are looking at this uh, smartphone with, with three sensors on the top. And uh, uh, the yellow color means uh, it has a higher weight and the blue color means it has a lower weight. weight. But it seems like the three sensors on the top uh, carry most of the weight. Um, and uh, it, it's the, the, the decoder weight is the surrogate of saying uh, how much this, this decoder, I mean this channel is contributing to the to the decoding. So I think in this case it means the three channels on the top contributes more to decoding. Um, and we can compare these uh, our result to uh, uh, to a previous study on speech decoding, uh, where they also apply this AAD method, and they found uh, that uh, there's a similar pattern. Uh, we found there's a similar pattern in the decoder weights for the three electrodes at at the top. Uh, C3 and C4 are closer to the two clusters with higher values, and the uh, and the CZ is in the middle, which is further away, further away from those two clusters. So, which is, and this pattern is exactly what we saw here uh, in our decoder weights. So, this correspondence is a good sanity check for both the hardware because it's a new product, and also for the algorithm because uh, I want to make sure that I'm implementing this AAD method. Uh, properly. And uh, with that decoder, we try to reconstruct uh, the stimulus envelope. So here, uh, I'm showing you the results from one uh, subject averaged across all the trials. So the blue trace here uh, is the original envelope, and the red one is the reconstruction, or say the predicted uh, envelope. So uh, in each section, uh, sorry, in each condition, or attention to left, attention to center, attention to right, we observe that in certain windows, like for example in, in this one, uh, in some certain time windows, uh, there's a high correspondence between the original the blue trace and the, the red trace. Uh, so the prediction, so, so it means that during those windows, this, uh, predict, this AAD method can can reconstruct this uh, original stimuli pretty well. But in some other windows, like uh, for example, if you look at here, these uh, red trace and the blue trace, they go in opposite ways. And, 
the, the reason why this is happening, it could be because that uh, the, this decoder is not getting enough data because we only have like uh, uh, around uh, uh, 30 seconds, uh, sorry, 30 minutes of data. So it, it may need more data to, to, to get a better decoder. But uh, it can also be the reason that the person is not paying full attention or very good attention during those windows. So then, uh, so it means, and, and because we are seeing more uh, correspondence in some time windows than the others, it means this attention, attention effort uh, from each subject can be a function of time. So they may choose to pay more attention uh, in some in, in some windows than the others, um, and this might be a uh, uh, so, and this might be determined by like uh, uh, by, by factors like for example when uh, a note is being played in a particular stream, and uh, or say how each subject scheduled their attention during the whole experiment to 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 do the task. And we should keep this uh, point in mind uh, for interpreting some results I will show later. So here I'm showing uh, the correlation uh, between, between the reconstruction and the envelopes of each uh, instrument. So the result is, uh, is average across all the trials, and each color here represents uh, a single subject. So uh, the pattern that we are expecting is that when you are paying attention to vibraphone, for example, the correlation with the, the, the vibraphone envelope should be higher. And when you are paying attention to piano, the correlation for piano is higher. And uh, since we are not, uh, uh, si since in these two uh, conditions, we are not paying attention to harmonica, the, cor the correlation with the harmonica envelope should always be close to zero. And this is exactly what we are seeing here which is a, a good a good sign. And uh, so, so we can use these features like the correlation with these two uh, envelopes as the feature for classification. And here are the results. Um, so the average of all the decoding accuracy is around 64%, uh, which is surely above the chance level. And in order for because uh, usually BCI systems, BBCI studies have a very small number of trials. So in order for it to go above, significantly above chance, uh, we have to exceed this, uh, uh, this dash line, which is around 58%. Uh, so, so the average result is uh, surely above that uh, significance level as well. Um, and also we are uh, also observing some uh, individual differences uh, with the highest accuracy being uh, around 70% and the lowest one even below the significance level. Uh, so the, in general, I mean, this is a good result because uh, now we know even with, even though we are using smartphone and the music, which is a very user-friendly, but much less optimal than uh, traditional EEG setups, uh, we can still decode att auditory attention uh, to a fair amount. So, so that's good. But the question is, can we improve it? And um, one way to improve it is just uh, re remember where, uh, when I showed you the reconstruction results, I mentioned that uh, uh, attention might be a function of time in many subjects. So during the, some windows, when you are not uh, paying much attention, uh, the correlation between the reconstruction and the original envelope might be low during that window. So keeping that information in our data pool may actually reduce the SNR, which in a way will reduce the, the overall decoding accuracy. So we, we, we may want to find a way to remove those, those windows when the person is not paying much attention and then classify on the re remaining data. So here, here's what I did. So first I want to, uh, with a new, EEG data. I want to uh, divide it into smaller segments just to capture those small windows of attention. And here I'm using two seconds of data for each segment with 80% uh, overlapping. And that gives us uh, 18 segments uh, roughly. And then, then we can input each of the segments into this attention decoder that we got before. And it, it's going to reconstruct 
with uh, the, the envelope for that two seconds. And then we can correlate that two seconds of, of envelope with the uh, two seconds of envelope for each of the instruments. And that's going to give us a correlation coefficient uh, for each segment. So in total, we will get, since we have 18 segments, we will have a two by 18 matrix as the, uh, as the, as the feature for each trial. Um, so now, how, how can we decide which ones to keep and which one to, to throw away? So let's go back to this correlation, uh, to, to this correlation result. So we are expecting to, to, to observe a gradient between these two variables or saying uh, when you are paying attention, the one that you are, you are attending to should have a higher correlation than the other. So when you are not paying much attention, and uh, so this sort of a gradient may disappear and it may end up as a very small value in difference if you, if you just subtract one from the other. So that's what I think maybe we can look into that feature, like the difference between the two to decide whether I want to throw away certain segments or, or I want to uh, keep them. So here I'm showing you this kind of difference feature, but I take the absolute value because uh, for a new trial, we don't know which one to subtract to be subtracted from which one. So just to be fair and uh, to be unbiased, so I, I'm just taking the, the, the absolute value between these two uh, variables. And uh, my assumption is uh, the more, the, the, the greater the, the value is, uh, the more attention you are paying to, or the more information there is in that segment. So here I'm showing you the absolute difference, this absolute difference from one single subject. And the x-axis is the segment number from one all the way to 18. And y-axis is the trial numbers from one all the way to whatever we have. So the blue segments are what we I think should be removed from um, for the reasons that I, I just mentioned. And the more yellow uh, a segment is, uh, the more that we should keep keep it for further analysis. So for this subject, the yellow the yellows are scattered around. It doesn't form a subsequent pattern. Whereas if I show you the result, uh, this same, same matrix for another subject, we can see uh, these yellow segments, they align pretty much uh, as certain segments. It seems like this, this person is using a very consistent way of focusing throughout the whole experiment. And uh, another way to visualize this is to sort each row by the absolute value. And uh, now it's very clear that uh, the subject at the bottom actually has higher values in this matrix than the other one. So now we can talk about um, that, uh, which one of the two subjects has a higher decoding accuracy in the, uh, if, if we use the whole trial as decoding uh, feature. So it's very obvious that this uh, subject five, for example, has a very high decoding accuracy because uh, these, uh, because he has more yellow yellow segments in this matrix. Um, so I think, so uh, we want to remove uh, these blue segments uh, on, the, on the right part of this matrix. And then we need to find the criteria to, to, to do that. The easy way will be just set a threshold value, uh, it's a fixed threshold value, like 0.4 in this case. Uh, then for this subject, uh, we are keeping roughly half of the data, which is good. But if well, we do that the same for the other one, for some trials, there even there's no survival uh, uh, like segments. So it's not ideal. Uh, therefore, we want to use a distribution-based uh, threshold, which we we start from this uh, matrix, and then we found the distribution of all the matrices of all, all the elements in this matrix, and then we found the medium of that as a cutoff and just a throw away. In this way, we can throw away half of the segments from each subject, so which uh, makes more sense than uh, just a fixed value. And um, so with that feature selection, uh, we can reduce this two by 18 matrix to a two by one, uh, to a two by one vector by doing this, by doing this. So as I said, uh, so since, since we, we don't want to bias 
the distribution using the testing data. So we first divide the whole data set into training data set and the testing. And with the training data set, we can calculate that uh, absolute difference feature and then form the distribution, find the median of that and use it as a threshold. And then we can calculate the mean of the survived segments for each trial, which means we are taking the average of each row here uh, with the one that, that is not masked by blue. So, so we are still working with uh, two by one uh, di di dimensionality, which is good for, for this uh, type of analysis because we don't have a lot of uh, data. And the result uh, is shown here. Uh, you can see this feature selection gives a lot of uh, uh, gains in decoding accuracy, especially for uh, these uh, few subjects. And the average now is above 70%, which is uh, a good number for, for this uh, like overall EG setup because we are trying to be more user friendly. And uh, so one thing I want to, so here I want to make a note about uh, the so-called BCI literacy because uh, in, in BCI studies, sometimes researchers may find that the signal uh, from certain subjects cannot be well decoded. And uh, so, but in the same time, this the same method may apply better very well on the other subjects. So some researchers may claim that oh, these subjects um, are not BCI literate because uh, they, their signal cannot be decoded. Uh, I'm not totally against this idea because uh, each person really, they, they, each person has a unique uh, anatomical structure in their, in their brain. So it's really possible that for some people, uh, their cortices are folded in the way that uh, some task relevant features cannot be captured. Um, so it's, it's truly possible. But there's also a possibility that sometimes there is just too much noise in the data and we need to remove them to see the real effect. For example, in this uh, in this case for subject four, it jumped from lower than, I mean, even below the, the chance level all the way to a pretty decent uh, decoding accuracy. So that, that's what I want to make in here. Um, so recently, I mean, uh, last week we thought about, we, we reviewed the whole like uh, analysis pipeline and we found maybe there we, we can use some ways to automate this uh, feature selection uh, process because uh, we are setting uh, like a hard threshold as 50% or the, the median uh, it's a subjective or it, it, it may actually may not be the, the optimal uh, threshold so we want to automate this and the easier way, the very obvious uh, choice for this is by using a, a convolutional neural network. And uh, so here we built a very simple neural net uh, with two convolutional layers in uh, one in each uh, like direction in, in the matrix and with some dropouts and uh, to, to make sure there's no overfitting. And uh, so I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because the result is not great. Um, the yellow bar the yellow bars are results from the CNN. So it's in some cases is working like in the subject four and five is uh, pretty close to the red bar, but in some other cases it's not. So I think it's because uh, we really don't have enough time to, to tweak the parameters or to, to revise the architecture. So this is just something we think that could work and it's not really optimal. So I think in the future, our team may surely uh, spend more time on this after my internship. So I want to compare my results uh, with other previous studies because uh, like uh, we are using here now, we are using a very user-friendly setup. I want to know how our uh, decoding pipeline performs. So before we jump to the decoding accuracy, I want to mention that compared to th these two studies, uh, we are using a, a far less uh, number of uh, channels and it's not even covering, covering the whole brain. And we are using music, is, which is more, more uh, pleasant, but it carries less uh, like uh, uh, contextual meanings in, uh, as in speech. And we are using a relatively shorter uh, like data for decoding. Uh, however, if we compare other studies using, also using this uh, linear auditory attention decoding uh, algorithm, uh, our result is actually not, not, not bad. 
So the decoding accuracy is 70%, which is uh, kind of medium. But if you take into account how, how much data we use, uh, it's the, the equivalent um, like efficiency of the system or the information transfer rate, uh, which is quantified as a bit in minutes, is actually way better than the other two. Uh, and also, one thing that, that's worth mentioning here is that in this, in this particular study, the authors proposed an end-to-end -end, uh, DNN architecture for classification. So this is a totally uh, different from using AAD to extract some high-level features first and then do uh, classification on those high-level features. Um, so in their study, they achieved uh, pretty good results uh, or a, a good gain compared to using this AAD method. So this is definitely something we want to try in the, in the future, given the huge boost and also the, the, the expertise of our team. Uh, but I still want to make uh, to, to give some merits to the AAD approach because AAD is inspired by neuroscience studies, and where the scientists they really observe this neurosignature from many many human subjects. Uh, however, in 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 neural net, I mean neural network is purely like data driven, so it is trained at the data we already have, which usually contains a, a like a I mean for 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 B test study this. Sample size is usually a small number. It's usually in a few tens of samples, or in some good cases, a few hundred. So if we train the architecture, which is purely data-driven, uh, like in, in a typical DNN architecture, uh, it involves like a, a large number of, of, of uh, variables to, to fit, like usually in hundreds of well, thousands, as in this paper. So. That means this is a hugely underdetermined uh, problem, not to mention that the signal to noise ratio for EEG is usually very low. So uh, therefore, I think uh, these DNN-based approaches may sometimes give a solution that might be tailored for the data set, but may not be easily generalizable to other data sets. Um, so uh, in the future, uh, there are a lot of things we can still work on. From this study, we learned that uh, uh, we can improve a lot in our study design. So we can some subjects reflect that uh, the the task is is not as is very not is not very challenging. So because the first reputation is always standard, so after after a few a few a few trials, they realize oh it's always the same for the, for, for the first reputation. So they start to pay less attention uh, when they hear it in, in the first run. And also, um, we can have better outball design because some people also reflect that uh, the outball in an unattended stream may also grab, may actively grab your attention during the task, and that we may reduce the, the the attention effort you are paying to the to the target. So maybe in the future we can use some other outball designs like uh, adding missing notes, uh, which grabs no attention but it can still be an outball. And also, we can have better stimuli design or experimental design. So here, one drawback of using this is so the vibraphone always starts first. So for a lot of people, their default attention mode is to the left. Uh, and then if the task is about attention to the right, it needs to shift their attention after a few seconds. So that's, again, that's something we learned from this uh, study. And we definitely want to improve in the in the future. And uh, also, we want to work more on the form factor, uh, so where we can have even more user-friendly uh, hardware, like in-ear electrodes, as I showed you before. And uh, despite all the all the negatives I, I, I said about the, the DNN approach, we want to try this end-to-end -end, uh, classification, because in that domain, we may suddenly have a lot of techniques to play with, like uh, data augmentation, which might help us to reduce the chance of overfitting and still giving us uh, generalizable generalizable uh, networks. So we already applied a, a CNN approach uh, to the to the study we had last year uh, and achieved good results. So we may try to use the same architecture here for this year's uh, study. So what do we learn from this uh, project? We found that we can acquire information from about cognitive states from very compact EEG devices. And this device doesn't have to cover the, the full brain uh, as many other EEG uh, systems do. And also we can use polyphonic music as a very uh, pleasant stimuli. 
and we can direct the user's attention to a specific instrument uh, instruments uh, by, by, by using specialization. And also we can decode a music attention uh, using a stimulus reconstruction method uh, and achieve uh, a good decoding accuracy. And with that, I want to thank my team. I want to thank my mentor, Hannes, to, for being a great mentor for two years for me. Uh, it's really nice talking to you every time. Um, and also, I want to thank Ivan for giving me this opportunity. And, uh, and special thanks to Dimitra for helping me get a lot of good data. And uh, it's really valuable for this project. And uh, I want to thank my colleagues in the audio and acoustic research group, and also the, uh, the MSR BCI team. It's really great to, to, to hear the updates every week and to share with what I found and get some feedbacks. They are very valuable to me. Uh, I want to thank my advisor for giving me, for being always uh, supportive. And also special thanks to my wife as well. Um, uh, uh, she's not on call here today, but she can hear it maybe next door. Um, none, 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 of, none of these can happen without her. So yeah, it's really grateful to 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 have this chance to do this project with all of you and thank you very much for your attention um yeah now i can take any questions you have thank you Nisha. thank you thank you so much Winko. um i believe hannes's call was dropped so i can i can act Oh, <laughs> as a moderator, um, that was a wonderful presentation. And I must say, as as someone who um, who recorded some of this data, as in I was actually a participant in the study, um, I wanted to mention that something that struck me as as interesting. You you said that the the top three electrodes showed the most promising mm -hmm. signatures. And what I've seen is that the top three electrodes were actually the ones with the poorest connection, which basically is very encouraging to know um, because the top ones were the ones that had the most contact with hair. And yeah. we happen to have quite a few females in the study that happen to have uh, lots of hair. So this is very encouraging. Basically, keep working on that optimal design, the hardware design, can certainly change uh, the results to be even much better than what yeah, you see. So, so for, for, for the impedance issue, yes, I also observed the same thing on my subjects. Because of the hair, the impedance for the top three sensors are always uh, higher than the others, because the others are directly contacting the skin. But uh, those noises are usually like in high frequency, so, because in my data, I in my study, I used the two to eight low frequency components. So I think that doesn't matter really much to mm -hmm. the to the analysis. And also here, uh, I want to show you. So we did this uh, beep test before each actual uh, experiment, just to to play beeps through the two uh, like uh, audio channels. And uh, this is a way to find uh, some like typical like auditory evoked potential. From the from the EG signal, it turns out the three at the top actually gives us very reliable ERP or event related potential from those beep tests. It's even better than the other like eight channels. So I think signal quality, I mean impedance wise, they might be low. I mean they, they might be worse than the others, but maybe signal wise they are even better. So that that that's what I think that may contribute to the uh, to the decoder weight uh, results. There's a question in the comments, Winko, if you want to take uh, a look. I had to... Uh, or I can read it. Uh, it's in the comments, right? Uh, At the end. Uh, is there a potential of being able to read attention from pre-existing songs, or at least to be able to detect if a given song has the requirement for being used. Um, so pre-existing, pre uh, so is Sam still on, 
on on the call. I'm 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 back. Yeah. Oh. Uh, so, sorry, sorry, my laptop crashed. I don't know what happened. Um, I think that I'm, I'm guessing the question is, can you use songs that the subject is already familiar with or Correct. decide beforehand whether uh, they are? I see. Yeah. So um, I, I think I think because when we, when we started this uh, study, we kind of hope that the subject already knew those songs and uh, so that it may increase the familiarity uh, of the song and the people may identify the outball very easily. Uh, so that, that's actually a hope, and uh, I think of course we can use some some song you already knew before, and but the the thing is, uh, it's not an easy task to do in, uh, to to pay attention to a particular element like like instruments for example in the song without any manipulation to the stimuli, so I mean it, especially for non 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 musicians, so that's why I think. Uh, in our in our study, we specialize it to make it to be a much easier job. Uh, so if we can do the same for other like pre-existing songs, then maybe yes, we can still do it. And also, I guess if yeah, oh, sorry, yeah, yeah, I, I guess I guess I guess if you think of uh, base work, right, the seamlessly, so there played at the same time but they follow the same they, they uh, follow the same rhythm so maybe potentially if you spatialize those two you could pay attention to one or the other say if you were using electronic music yeah and also if you want to apply this uh, AAD method actually if you look at how this uh, decoder is is calculated it's uh, it's not discriminating any particular sound it's, you're just putting everything together to train this decoder. So I think in that way that uh, we don't have very specific requirements for what, what song can be used, but uh, maybe not very loud <laughs> or noisy. I don't know, it's just my guess. <laughs> um, there was one one question. Uh, oh, sorry. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, there was one. There was one question in the messages about the uh, <clears throat> the census, and I see Dimitri already replied. But uh, yeah, they're just they're just little. Uh, this the census inside the headphones are just little sponges similar to earplugs, like foamy foamy earplugs that are soaked in in uh, salty water, basically. So yeah, no the, gel involved. Yeah, the the white parts are that the, they are just sponges and. Uh, you have to squeeze them to put them into the socket. But uh, in order to use them, you have to soak them before the experiment for overnight and uh, in insulin solution. So, yeah. But they're kind of pandemic friendly because they're disposable. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so there's that advantage. Yeah, I, I just, hi, sorry, this is Rick. I just didn't know if they're really wet. Do they leave your hair wet, or your head wet, or is it just slightly moist? Uh, it's uh, so in the beginning uh, when you first put it on, it may be wet a little bit. There, I mean, and also if you soaked it for a long time and you didn't squeeze a lot, there might be some water drops from from your head. But uh, after a while, it uh, it's just uh, moist uh, or, or around the sensor region. So I guess it's still still okay. Yeah, I've been thinking about other kinds of sensors like uh, near infrared, um, you know, other kinds of things that might passively or I guess actively uh, light up an area. So I don't know, have those been used or do you think that might function in this case? Um, so the the thing with FNIRS is like is is is, is that uh, it's capturing like a blood oxygen change over time. So this oxygen change uh, is a is a slow plot process, like usually in 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 order of a few seconds, like uh, so, which means I mean we will play a sound and when you're waiting for that blood signal blood oxygen uh, level to go up to the peak, it may take like uh, five to six seconds. So in that case, it may not be able to capture very quick dynamics as we are playing here, like we are playing sounds, then you may not capture those. But uh, it might be a good good tool to capture other things like a stress level, for example. 
there might be more some more reliable signatures for those type of uh, uh, applications. Cool, thanks. Mm -hmm. One, I guess, I guess, uh, just a follow-up comment. I think, I think, given that right now the trial length is eight seconds, right, Winko? Mm -hmm. um, in our case, so, so if if you could reliably detect attention shift with FNIRS, you would kind of be in the same ballpark, right? <clears throat> in terms of, in terms of, <clears throat> sorry, in terms of um, lag. Um, so right yes. now with 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 the method with the method with AAD, you basically need at least four or five seconds right now of data to determine an attention shift. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, the, the the duration of the, I mean, the, the length of the, the the trial is is one aspect. The other one is the spatial uh, temporal resolution. So yeah. it's not just being delayed, but it's also like smeared in time. So yeah. you're all, you're only seeing very slow dynamics in in both signal or in in F near signal. So uh, I think we cannot apply the AAD method in here uh, uh, for for F near sensors, but there might be other algorithms we can use. Uh, right. Yeah. I, I guess I guess the I guess my my point is, uh, or my question to you is, do do you know what the um, are you familiar with any studies that use FNIR for attention decoding? It might be interesting to know what their decoding accuracy is. Just say mm. left, right, left versus right. Well, uh, I can't think of any at the top of my head, but uh, since our lab is, is working on spatial attention uh, to sound, mm -hmm. and we also have a postdoc in doing FNIRs in, in the, on that, so may, maybe there there is already some. <laughs> okay. Yeah. The papers I have seen, they typically average F near signals for 60 seconds before to get a reliable reading. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. that's similar to what uh, FMI is doing. Like you have a very long uh, session of, of experiment and then you collapse the time time domain signal to, to, to get information about this space. So yeah, I guess, I guess Maybe like they, 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 it's a little bit stretched if we only use 10 seconds. <laughs> yeah. Maybe FNR in that case would be low. Um, I, I have a, a question, unless there are others. I think there, there are, let's see, a couple of, oh. there was a comment uh, in the messages about um, breaking down a single song into different tracks and then treat those as different stimuli. Um, I think that 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 might that might work, I guess. Mm -hmm. I guess the similarity between the different uh, segments might be a problem here, focusing on one segment versus another when all the instruments are the same, the sound is the same, and they're just different places in time. That might be a little tricky. Well, there was one question about how did you collect potential or correct stimuli data to calculate the mean squared error? Oh, so this uh, correct, wait, the mean squared error for the decoder, I assume. Um, Where's my decoder? So if you mean, uh, if you're asking for the mean squared error about the true uh, stimuli, then because we already know know the envelopes of the stimuli, we we know what what we are playing to the subject, so we use them as a ground truth, and uh, yeah, so and then we try to reconstruct using this method, and we can compare them. I'm not sure whether that answers. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so, so uh, Rick, you had another question. Yeah, I was. I'm. I can speak mm -hmm. it faster than I'm typing. I'm. I'm only about halfway through with typing. So, uh, yeah. So the this is an interesting result. You know, you you're showing that there's a spatial sensitivity to these sensors. My intuition, and I'm I'm just a, an amateur at this, but my intuition would have told me maybe the ear pieces would have been more sensitive, if you will, to picking up these signals, but but your results seem counterintuitive. So what is it about, you know, either the brain function or where things are ending up in the head for this music attention that makes the top pieces more 
sensitive than in the ears? So yeah, th that's a very good question because in the beginning, I also expect to see more from the sides than on the top. Uh, especially if, if you look at this uh, topography, these clusters are actually around the auditory cortex, which is on the side. Uh, but uh, I, so one thing I can think of is uh, is when we are doing some some uh, beep test, like uh, you're 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 trying to give you the person some beeps from two sides. Uh, the most effect we see actually is on the top. It's because for most people, these cortices are folded in a way that is pointing to the middle. So if you sum them up, actually, uh, even though I mean those cortices are actually around this area, but those those dipoles are like batteries. Mm -hmm. They're pointing to the to the to, to the more like center. Mm -hmm. So that's something I can think of for now to explain this. And of course, the other thing is uh, if you look at our beep test. Uh, Sanity track. The three sensors on the top always have very good uh, SNR, whereas the others, for some subjects, I mean, this is already a good good example. For some subjects, it could be even even messier than this. So, I think the signal quality may be another issue, and uh, especially because uh, these areas are very close to other lot of muscles. So, if the subject move a little bit, then there will be some artifacts. So. Yeah, I guess that also contributes to why the the the, the weight for a contribution for those sensors are not as good as the top ones. Got it. Mm -hmm. I see one raised hand by Ali. Yeah, that's me. Uh, many thanks, Rico, for the exciting work and the nice presentation. And actually, I got a question for uh, slide 22 that you mm -hmm. are <laughs> yeah. actually. Uh, do, you, do you remember uh, the range of uh, the values uh, for uh, electrode weights? So here we have low to high. Are they from negative yeah. values to the positive values? No, so the way I did it is uh, because I observed a lot of uh, variabilities uh, across uh, like subjects. So I, I normalize everything first. So I take the, I think I take the, the, the summation of that and, and divided that from each sensor. So it's like a percentage. So it's normalized across different subjects. Uh, and if you are asking for the raw value, uh, I think no, 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 Winko. I, yeah. Actually, I, I'm not looking for the value. So uh, the point that uh, I want to make is that if the range is from negative value to positive values, uh -huh. therefore uh, e uh, electrodes around here are also important uh, as much oh, as the true. electrodes on top are important. However, yeah. if these numbers are absolute values, therefore uh, electrodes uh, around yeah. CZ right. or on top are just important. Yeah, they yeah. are. They're they are, I, I, I'm taking the absolute value for. Oh, yeah, great, 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 great. Okay, are there, if I don't see any more raised hands and I don't see other questions in the, um, in the chat box, so. Dimitra. I can, I can ask a more general question. So oh, sorry. After all this experience, Winko, um, and and the the hardware that you uh, um, you experimented with, would you recommend any any design updates or what would you recommend as a change as an addition to the hardware you were given that could potentially he help um, this kind of work? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that's a good good question. So I think the idea of of building. EEG electrodes into a headphone is a smart idea, uh, but there are also a lot of considerations on how to make it more comfortable. Uh, I think if for this smartphone design, uh, they they want to make sure that there's good contact between the electrodes and the skin, so they intentionally make this uh, this this band part really really rigid, and uh, and that well, it, you can imagine with, with with something like coming out from the that the earphone and it's pushing you all the time, then uh, it causes some some sometimes pain or discomfort from the subject. So I think uh, being ergonomic is a very 
uh, basic but very valuable uh, part in this kind of uh, design. So maybe in some, some, I don't know, I don't know whether it's going to work, but with some more soft material, but in the meantime also uh, like pro providing good con like connectivity between the scalp and the sensor would be great. Uh, I, I don't know if there's any like gel, but it's, they're, they're not liquid gel, but they can stay in place for a long time. And uh, when, you, when, you, when you squeeze it, it's going to be pressed, but you know, something like that. So, um, or sticky uh, to make sure there's contact, but there's no good, like a lot of pressure on the side. And uh, yeah, that's for the headphone. But I mean, if, if, if the, the in-ear electrodes can also uh, can, can be proved to be very uh, reliable in giving meaningful data, then yeah, that's also a very good place to, to work on. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Winko. I think um, um, I think Ali, you still have your hand raised. Otherwise, I don't see any other hands. I I no, say no, 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 that uh, was a mistake. Okay. So I I think um, if there are more questions from people, you can you can still reach Winko at his Microsoft address until tomorrow, right? Yes. And otherwise you can reach out to us and we can we can forward questions or we can maybe um, continue the discussion offline. Um, so I want to thank Winko once again for a great presentation and a great second internship project. Well done, Winko. Thank you very much. Thank you. And that uh, concludes today's presentation. Thank you, everyone. And Dimitra, please stop the recording. Uh -huh.